Welcome back, everyone, to the symposium that is held hybrid in Osaka University and online through Zoom. We have received confirmation that Mr. Welly from Great Giant Food is unable to join us today due to prior um, engagements, so we will move on to the next session. In this session, we will hear presentations from Dr. Amadeus Driando Ahnan Winarno from Better Nature and Professor Tsunehiro Otsuki from Osaka University School of International Public Policy. Before that, I would like to welcome back our moderator for this session, Dr. Shuichi Shimma. Without further ado, time is yours. Thank you very much. I continue to moderate this session. So the next speaker is uh, Amadeus Giuliano. Uh, Giuliano um, uh, Winaro, <laughs> sorry. Uh, the title of his talk is Food Waste Reduction Using Temper Fermentation. Oh, so please start your presentation. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a great pleasure for me to be here. Thank you very much for inviting me. Fukusaki Sensei, Sastia Sensei, Osaka University. And I would like to say a great greeting to all respectable attendees. Today we're going to talk about uh, reducing food waste and loss using temper fermentation. I'm Driando from Better Nature LTD, a startup innovating on temper fermentation based in the UK and Indonesian temper movement who promotes education on tempeh. My life mission is to give people more access to affordable, nutritious and sustainable sources of protein by innovating on tempeh fermentation. Again, very briefly, why should we care about reducing food waste and loss? Just like the previous speakers have mentioned, it's a very multidimensional phenomena, right? So on one hand, we know that about 800 million people are undernourished. On the other hand, we know that almost 17% of global food production is wasted. And in some countries, we know it's higher than that. Like Indonesia is about a third. In the US, it's about a third. So how could we connect both to solve some problems? We also know that global food waste also contributes to about 10% of the greenhouse gas emission. That contributes to climate change. And we know that climate change could produce other more problems, such as more undernutrition, more people cannot eat because of changes in climate. So what can we do? Today, I would like to present a potential solution called tempeh fermentation. Now, if I may ask, how many of you have tried tempeh? Ah, we, we have still so many people have not tried tempeh. If you ate the bento today, you would find tempeh orek. That's what we're going to talk about today. So this is how tempeh looks like. In Indonesia, very easy to find. We have a push cart that go in front of people's houses that sell tempeh like this, wrapped in banana leaves. You can see the beans. These are soybeans sliced with the white part, and the white part is, is mycelium. It's fungi, so it's produced using fermentation. In the middle is one of the most, fav most favorite dishes of tempeh. It's fried tempeh, tempeh goreng, uh, my favorite childhood snack. And on the right, this typical Indonesian dish. You got white rice, you got tempeh, you got vegetables, and you got some crunchy crackers, krupuk. Now, why is this a solution? So what is exactly tempeh? As you can see here, it's a produce, a product made using fermentation by Rhizopus rhizopus oligosporus, rhizopus orize, different kinds of fungi. And actually, tempeh was first documented in the 1600s, so more than 300 years ago in Indonesia. It was written in an ancient inscription called Saracentini, who was written by this prince of an ancient kingdom in Indonesia called Surakarta Kingdom or Solo Kingdom. And it was served as a traditional food for kings, so it's very prestigious food. But unfortunately, these days, there's some negative stereotype in Indonesia that, oh, tempeh is very cheap, it's everywhere, it's food of the poor. And today, I would like to talk about why it is not food of the poor. It is one of the coolest food, it's actually for me, it's the coolest food because of scientific facts. Interestingly, my grandfather was born in the village where the first documentation of tempeh was found in Klaten. 
and I'm wearing this batik in Klaten, and with fam my family name is Winarno, and this batik is Winarnan from the Tempe. So I got Tempe in my blood and in my clothes today. <laughs> to give you more ideas about what Tempe is and how it's made, this is how Tempe is quite traditionally produced. It's very simple. The art of making tempeh is the art to make this microorganism, Rhizopus fungi, happy. Let's imagine we want to make these baby mushrooms, quote unquote, fungi happy, so they can grow into adult mushroom that live happily. They can bind these beans together into something compact that we can slice and we can eat or cook just like meat. So first, the baby mushrooms like their food to be tender. And that's why we soak the beans overnight. And we want to peel the skin. We want to remove the skin because the baby mushrooms don't want the skin. Then we want to cook them, boil them until it's fragrant again, because the baby mushrooms like the food to be cooked and tender. But the baby mushrooms don't like the food to be too hot. So we need to wait for a little bit longer to let it cool down. And we can dry them using paper towel. Here we use a mixture of soybean and mung beans. And after it's quite dry, we will add the baby mushrooms come in actually in the sata culture. So the sata culture comes in powder form and it actually contains the spores of the fungi. So we mix the baby mushrooms with the baby foods we mix it together. My mom likes to do it like washing hand kind of gesture. And once the baby mushrooms are met with their food, we can put them into their bedrooms. So babies need bedrooms. Here we can use uh, full leaves. Traditionally in Indonesia, we can use plastic bags. But the bedrooms need windows. So if you use plastic bags, you would want to poke holes so they can breathe so they can breathe. If you use fold leaves, there's already some airways, so you don't need to poke leaves. Temperate fermentation is typically optimized between about 28 degrees Celsius to 32 degrees Celsius. Indonesian temperature is perfect. It's always summer in Indonesia, so you can store it between about two to three days. And after that, you open it, you would find this compact, white, ready to slice, ready to be cooked, and you can eat it just like meat. In fact, Indonesia eats tempeh more than meat, more than eggs, and more than tofu. So just like that, you have these options to create this many variation, even tempeh maki, even tempeh tako, and typical Indonesian fried tempeh, even meat replacement or in spaghetti. We can make so many variations of tempeh, it's amazing. Now, why tempeh? Um, I love tempeh. I dedicate my life for tempeh, actually. I did research on tempeh. Because one, the reason on the left is my grandfather from the village of tempeh. Um, there is a risk of cancer running in my family. My grandfather had to do his own surgery onto his own mom, um, who was suffering from breast cancer due to her tumor in her breast. My grandfather had to do the surgery and because of the trauma, he switched from being a vet to being a food scientist, and that changed the family history. So I know that my mom has increased risk of cancer. That made me think that how can I reduce the risk of cancer through food, something that I love? How could I protect my mom from having an increased risk of cancer? So that's my first emotional why. My second one is that I live in Bogor, it's not too far from Chitarum River. Unfortunately, it has been nominated as the number one most polluted river in the world. And as a young person, I thought, how could I contribute to improving this situation? And my third why is I often travel to the eastern part of Indonesia um, with my uncle and my aunt, who don't have any kids. So I was treated as uh, their kid. Unfortunately, I, bef um, I met some malnourished children, and I thought, how could I contribute to this issue? So three reasons, health, sus sustainability, and food equality or accessibility. And these are the three values of tempeh. And after that, I was obsessed with bodybuilding. 
I wanted six pack, I wanted the highest muscle mass, I wanted the lowest fat mass, so I tried different sources of protein. I tried eating meat, drinking milk, eating eggs every day, but either that left me financially broke or bloated. So I looked up some scientific literature and I found tempeh has a great potential, it's nutritious, high in protein. So that got me interested furthermore in research, researching on tempeh. I researched on tempeh at the University of Massachusetts Amherst, co-founded the Indonesian Tempeh Movement, co-founded the Better Nature LTD company in the UK. I run marathons. I hope to run the Tokyo Marathon uh, to promote tempeh too. And I make tempeh songs on Spotify, if that helps. And in short, tempeh is my ikigai as a Japanese concept, what I love, what I think I'm good at, what the world needs, and how I can make a living from. And growing on Ikigai, I find Tempeh with my research career, with my company career, with my charity career, it's the passion of my life. And so I was very curious about the Tempeh world. I really wanted to summarize every single Tempeh journal article into one compilation. In fact, I've been compiling it to do the Tempeh movement until I published it in 2021. People call it Tempe Bible. So all of the content of my presentation, you can access it by Googling Tempe Bible. There's this comprehensive scientific review paper that you can access. So let's get started. Um, there's a growing number of Tempe research rate lately. As you can see in the graph, there's this increase since the 1990s to today. And if you could see, Yes, tempeh is uh, much less researched than soy, a little bit much less researched than tofu, but the trend is picking up, as you can see, especially in the past decade. So I wanted to read, I wanted to summarize every single tempeh journal article. I had gone through, for example, oh, screening 700,000 documents on Google Scholar and 1,000 documents from here until I get about 300 documents that I summarize in the so-called tempeh Bible. The first great important thing about tempeh is about nutrition. Compared to beef, amazingly, tempeh contains similar amounts of energy and protein, much less saturated fat, same low carbohydrate content, significantly higher fiber content, significantly higher calcium content, about the same iron content, much less sodium content, and tempeh can contain vitamin B12, which people usually believe it only is contained in animal product. But on the other hand, beef doesn't necessarily contain vitamin B12. So I thought, wow, tempeh is amazing. The second one is about sustainability. This graph shows how many grams of protein that we can produce for every unit of energy. Here are the units of megajoule of energy, and you can see here, for beef, beef can produce 4.4 grams of protein for every one megajoule of energy. And tempeh can produce almost four times higher protein content, which is about 17.3 grams of protein for every megajoule of energy. Not only in terms of energy, the sustainability, the sustainability aspect of tempeh also comes from the emission. For example, beef, for one kilogram of carbon dioxide equivalent greenhouse gas emission released to the environment, beef will produce 7.1 grams of protein, while tempeh can produce almost 20 times, sorry, almost 12 times higher content of protein, which is about 160 grams of protein with the same amount of kilogram carbon dioxide equivalent released to the environment. So not only is nutritious and sustainable, in Indonesia, you can get tempeh about like only one eighth of the price of beef. Nutritious, sustainable, affordable. What about the health benefit? So from the review paper, I tried to map what health potential health benefits that tempeh can have. And you can see uh, we have different strengths. For example, green is clinical study, red is population study, uh, blue is in vitro, yellow is in vivo, and there are many categories. For example, malnutrition, skeletal muscle recovery, gut health, lung health, cognitive function, obesity, diabetes, liver health, cardiovascular health, cancer, anemia, and bone health. And if we map it out, it's all due to the benefit of tempeh fermentation. 
for example. Temper fermentation can increase calcium, vitamin B12, folate, isoflavone bioavailability, protein content, iron, and paraprobiotics. And these have relations to these health conditions. But if we map it out, most of it lead to this one point, which is isoflavone bioavailability. Interestingly, this is also the so-called phytoestrogens. Sometimes there's this myth that, oh, don't eat soy, don't eat tofu, don't eat tempeh, because it has phytoestrogen. If you're men, you would look like women. No, it's a myth. Actually, these phytoestrogens are the bioactive compounds that actually give potential health benefits mentioned. And more into the fermentation itself. Tempeh can be made not only with soybean. Tempeh has been made and researched and published, made by more than 20 grains, nuts, or legumes. For example, oh, we got this oats, and we got this barley, we got this mung beans, koro beans, we got this chickpeas, uh, navy beans, and kidney beans. Many, many substrates can be made into tempeh. And interestingly, there is some red thread of the effects of tempeh fermentation. Typically, tempeh fermentation can increase the bioactive compound level, protein content level, and its bioavailability, free fatty acid level, phytosterol level, carbohydrate level, ash and mineral, vitamin B12, vitamin B, folate, and increasingly, interestingly, decreasing anti-nutrients, toxins, and allergens. So tempeh fermentation is amazing. And for today's topic, what about temper fermentation and food waste upcycling? This is interesting because it's inspired by this tempeh made of okara, or the, the food byproduct in the soy milk industry or tofu industry, for example. This is called tempeh gumbus. It's actually the food of my grandfather's childhood. It is tempeh for the poor. When people couldn't buy soybean tempeh, they would eat tempeh gumbus because it's cheaper, they cannot buy the whole soybean. So you can cook it fried, or put it with some batter around it, or even make skewers. And interestingly, it's not only that it's edible, by processing this tofu or soy milk byproduct, we're upcycling food waste into something edible, but not only edible, it's also with increased health benefit. The tempeh gumbus has the potential to have improved digestion properties by oh, this research from Matsuo in 1995, reduced gut transit time um, than pure fiber, for example. It could also, also improve cardiovascular health by reducing cholesterol level more than unfermented okara. A trial in rats also by Matsuo and Hitomi, 1993, and improved liver health by decreasing liver glutathione peroxidase level in rats. As you can see, this is a perfect example of Japan and Indonesia collaboration because we know tempeh, you know some other technologies, we can do collaboration. And not only tempeh made using okara, tempeh can also be made using coconut press cake. However, this is very dangerous because it is prone to contamination. So. My grandpa used to eat this kind of tempeh until there was an outbreak in Indonesia that killed almost 10,000 people in the 1990s. No, pr uh, before that. So because of the substrate is using, is using coconut press cake, it is prone to the contamination of Bucoderia glidioli, pathophora cocofenans, who can produce bone cracking acid toxin. And so please do not try to make or eat this unless we apply strict pH adjustment to 4.5 and strict food hygiene standards. Why do I present this tempeh bonkrek? Because we know that tempeh fermentation has the potential to upcycle food waste into this health promoting food, but we need to be careful because fermentation can do both ways. So yes, there's this potential, but yes, there's this food safety precautionary that we need to take. One of the last examples is tempeh made of peanut press cake, just like the tofu byproduct, soy milk byproduct, coconut milk byproduct. There's also these peanut 
praise cake. Again, it can create delicious product. This is not dangerous, so don't worry about this. It has the potential of improved nutrition profile, like improved amino acid contents, improved fatty acid contents, and it can be potential emergency food because it has rich fat content. So that's another example. Temper fermentation can upcycle food byproducts in a natural way. And lastly, this is one of my projects. At Better Nature LTD, we receive grants from the European government and we work with other companies in the space. So we want to create a future plant-based seafood made using food byproducts. So we use temper fermentation. We experiment it with different food byproducts like brewers spent grain from the beer industry and from oat okara, from soy okara to create this upcycled food with potential health benefits and to address the rising boom in the plant-based market. So, that's the potential of temper fermentation. Now, to conclude my presentation, I would like to invite you all to imagine. Now, we know that temper fermentation can be made using so many substrates, right? Let's imagine that every country around the globe applies temper fermentation to their own local crops and to their own local food byproduct from the biggest industries. We can create so many great changes. And this is just the beginning because the future of temper fermentation is absolutely exciting. As you can see, we can play with the shape, with the form of temper fermentation, and we can make tempeh's edible bowl. You can use edible flowers in tempeh with colorful beans. You can make or tempeh from different beans, and you can create different colors of tempeh, and you can even create this sculpture using tempeh fermentation because it's a solidifying bioprocess. So because of this exciting technology of tempeh fermentation, I would like to invite you all to introducing this tempeh fermentation to all parts of the globe with the tempeh movement. Thank you so much for your time, and I hope this would um, be beneficial for all of us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm very interested in uh, different kind of tempeh. Now, I never eat the uh, coconut tempeh. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay, next speaker is uh, Professor uh, Tsunehiro Otsuki from Osaka University. Please start your presentation when you are ready. Good afternoon. Um, I'm Tsunehiro Otsuki, and thank you uh, very much for your introduction, um, Professor Ashima. And um, um, I really appreciate for uh, uh, Professor Fukusaki to, uh, to give me the opportunity to join your project uh, about COI Next, and also uh, uh, to have opportunity to present here. Um, so I'm a professor of economics at uh, Osaka, Public, uh, Osaka International Public Policy, and I'm teaching mainly uh, development economics. And um, this project um, is really attracting to me that uh, food loss issue is really new to me. And uh, we I have been studying more uh, on uh, um, food safety standards or regulation. And uh, this is a great uh, opportunity to uh, apply the uh, method for this new area of research. And uh, I uh, also work with uh, um, Professor uh, uh, Honda, uh, KHO uh, uh, Honda uh, from uh, uh, Kumamoto Prefecture University and uh, ID Jetro uh, Mitsuo Michida, and also working with uh, uh, Professor Fukusaki uh, and uh, Professor Muranaka and Professor Hom Honda, um, <coughs> and uh, also uh, working with a young fellow, uh, the, uh, Marikuru Ekuram. Uh, he's uh, really uh, helping us uh, in this project. So. Um, I'm a leader of a, a task force um, uh, team of this uh, CONX project, and I'm probably the, uh, the minor uh, kind of entity uh, of, uh, uh, in this team because in this project because I, I'm more uh, in the uh, social economic uh, uh, person, and the the others are doing more like uh, uh, natural science and. So I'm uh, really, you know, hoping to have a synergy in research and to, to come up with an uh, interesting finding uh, and also a useful 
uh, suggestion to the society in terms of uh, uh, you know, reducing uh, food loss. Okay, um, so according to FAO, the, uh, about one third of food in the world is discarded. The far majority of the food loss and waste occurs in the supply side, including storage, processing, and uh, distribution, in addition to production. And therefore, uh, food loss reduction requires um, the uh, effort at each stage of value change. And um, and it's um, <clears throat> very important to understand the, the stage, um, how the uh, food waste is uh, occurred in each stage and also, the, uh, to see this, uh, syst this uh, you know, uh, circulation of food um, as a system and provide useful uh, um, you know, policy prescription for this you know, um, issue. Um, the uh, task teams uh, one to three are working on these uh, uh, technologies. Uh, the development of rapid monitoring technologies uh, and uh, also um, uh, smart data logger system and also the zero waste recycling oriented food materials. And our task is to first uh, to evaluate the impact of those um, uh, technologies uh, when it is uh, introduced to the society and also um, you know, how it is feasible uh, to introduce to these uh, technologies because there is a cost and benefit uh, of those food and uh, those technologies. So um, the, there are several problems that, that I define in, uh, uh, in proceeding with this uh, research, um, particularly from the uh, economic side uh, uh, viewpoint. The cost of introduction of a low food, uh, uh, I mean food loss reduction is costly, and, but it is essential for social implementation to create sufficient benefits that exceed the cost. And it is also necessary to uh, create benefit for producers' uh, effort, uh, effort to reduce food loss by making consumer varying the, uh, varying the, the uh, uh, benefit uh, of uh, low food loss. So th that is related to ethical consumption. That is the main uh, topic uh, in our research. <clears throat> and the, uh, also, uh, uh, it is important uh, to raise awareness of the producers uh, in terms and distributors and retailers on the supply side to understand the, um, the, you know, how the food loss should be uh, reduced using the cutting edge the technologies. So um, ethical consumption is a behavior to solve uh, social problems through uh, consumption and to support sellers who work for those goals. And such uh, goals would include uh, sustainability and environmental conservation, and therefore we hope that ethical consumption um, or which support food loss reduction will have a significant impact on the society. And to solve food loss uh, problems, uh, we need global uh, collaboration. Um, and for bananas, for example, farmers in Indonesia and consumers in Japan um, <coughs> work together um, uh, to create lo uh, low food loss value chains and uh, sus sustainable society. Uh, the lesson learned from private sustainability standards such as fair trade and rainforest alliance would help us to uh, you know, study the new uh, uh, type of uh, ethical consumption. So uh, it is important uh, to uh, understand how consumers' perception of environmental uh, or uh, social characteristics inherent in products, uh, such as sustainability certificates. And some studies have uh, indicated that consumers are getting more and more inclined toward purchasing food with sustainability certificates. Um, but it is also important to note that consumers' uh, recognition of the importance of sustainability is a key to this change. And not to mention uh, consumers' attributes such as age, and gender, and education affect their behavior. So uh, if we um, uh, move 
toward the, the more stylized model of um, <clears throat> economics to analyze this issue. Um, we can uh, kind of you know, uh, map these uh, factors uh, in, in, into this, um, this uh, kind of uh, chart. The first, uh, the attribute of a good uh, can be uh, related to the people's utility. People feel utility uh, from having good, with a good uh, attribute, such as uh, fresh, uh, you know, fresh foods or uh, the uh, very tasty uh, food. Okay. And, and also ethical attribute uh, will affect utility. Um, so that's the thing that, uh, that we have mentioned, the environmental consideration and the reduction of a food loss. Um, and also the consumer's uh, attribute, consumer's uh, um, characteristic will affect the benefit. So the people feel differently, uh, you know, because people uh, uh, are different in terms of uh, age, gender, and uh, uh, also education history. So uh, people might care environment more than others because they, they are more uh, aware of environment um, because of education or because of the, you know, uh, the uh, ethical, um, you know, uh, stand, stands. So now uh, we uh, had the a study, a empirical study a called conjoint analysis in this project and uh, to analyze the uh, uh, consumer's willingness to pay. This is like how much consumer want to pay for additional uh, attributes, uh, particularly uh, you know, low food loss attribute uh, through the, uh, the use of the technologies that are suggested by this, uh, this COI Next project. Okay. Um, so, um, this uh, conjoint analysis is a method to uh, measure the, the extent to which uh, product attribute uh, influence the purchase of a product. And since it measures the willingness to pay by um, taking into account the budget constraint. So the people make a, a kind of a real, realistic decision um, because they, you know, they can say, uh, you know, okay, this attribute is very important, so they, they pay for, you know, better environment or better f uh, situation of food loss. So, uh, but if they face budget constraint, then they have to choose. So they have to choose between different, uh, you know, attributes, uh, and also the price matters. So uh, people make, uh, you know, uh, rational decision given these um, uh, conditions, okay? And uh, we conducted analysis for uh, banana, um, and uh, we use web-based uh, survey to collect data uh, of consumers. And we show uh, respondent multiple hypothetical products uh, differing in price and freshness and the characteristics of uh, interest, uh, which is the use of real-time monitoring technology to reduce uh, food loss in our study. And we conducted uh, conjoint analysis for banana uh, and, and because uh, it, it is the, one of the major interests of this, uh, the entire project. And also, uh, that's an important export uh, from Indonesia. So we did a slightly different uh, setup for uh, this food loss attribute uh, to form uh, two groups. The group one with a degree of food loss uh, that is the one, one of the uh, you know, food loss-related attributes, um, which is inherent in the product uh, characteristics. And group B uh, with a quality of improvement um, through technology. Okay. Um, um, <clears throat> so, um, the use of technology would uh, improve in, say, uh, you know, uh, tastiness or freshness of the project uh, product. So uh, that will also, uh, you know, uh, be considered by a respondent. So the group A, group B are, are different in in that aspect. And here is our result. Uh, the result indicates that freshness uh, is the most important uh, parameter after price. Price is most important. And food loss percentage and quality uh, improvement show a moderate change in the uh, marginal willingness to pay. Okay. Um, 
the marginal willing space is like um, the how much consumer would want to pay for additional uh, uh, level of attributes, such as the 10% uh, more, uh, I mean 10% less of a food loss, or uh, you know 10% uh, more of a quality like that. So uh, if you look at this portion, then the freshness matters a lot to the consumer because the average price of a banana uh, in our uh, experiment is a 250 yen. And uh, so freshness matters um, the almost you know, 100% uh, to the consumers. And the f food loss uh, also uh, matters to the consumers, but um, uh, it only moderately. And uh, the quality also, uh, for group B, they, they consider quality of the, uh, you know, quality raised by this, uh, the new technologies. Okay, so uh, it, they are statistically significant, but it's not uh, uh, large. So um, we also checked the, the uh, uh, the consumers uh, who know food loss uh, issues or not, uh, whether you know that matters to their uh, willingness to pay or not, and the answer is yes. Um, so the people who know the food loss issue um, uh, has higher uh, willingness to pay, and the, also the people who does effort to reduce food loss. Uh, in, in their daily life, also uh, uh, consider that the food loss uh, attribute is important. Okay. So, uh, in summary, uh, lesson learned from our conjoint analysis uh, is as follows. The reduction of a food loss and improvement of quality as a label uh, appeal to consumers, at least to some extent. Um, However, we should note that the questionnaire uh, can be improved to solicit a pure um, variation of the use of low food loss technology. Um, and also information given to, uh, in prior to uh, the respondent uh, it, it matters to their uh, response because uh, you know, uh, if we give some information about the technology and how it affects the uh, food loss, uh, would be considered by the respondent. So um, if they know the, the relationship uh, fully, then they, can, uh, uh, they have more favorable answer to uh, food loss reduction. Um, so it's uh, kind of you know, um, <clears throat> not surprising, but um, this is the first study to really confirm this uh, uh, relationship uh, quantitatively by using data, okay? Um, and uh, certainly understanding and encouraging effort uh, of a food loss might improve the market value of uh, low food loss product. So um, this is uh, still preliminary and uh, we would like to uh, you know, improve on this, uh, this uh, result. And um, also our uh, young researcher, um, um, uh, Mr. Um, Ikram Marikuru, uh, did an interesting research um, in his PhD uh, program, that uh, he uh, analyzed the uh, cost and benefit of um, introducing the um, smart gas sensor um, uh, in tropical food export, and uh, the one for banana and another for uh, also uh, shrimp export. And uh, he uh, found out that um, the introduction of these uh, uh, new technologies uh, would raise uh, more uh, profit rather than the cost. So uh, this you know, uh, technology would be feasible uh, to, to, uh, to be introduced in the real uh, economy. And um, so this is uh, what we have now. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Otsuke Sensei. No, I think uh, the education is very important to change the customer's behavior. And as a result, I think the uh, food reduction can be realized. And thank you, baby. I would like to close this session and please.
Thank you to Dr. Amadeus Driando Ahnan Winarto, Professor Tinehiro Otsuki, and our moderator, Dr. Shiichi Shima, for today's delightful talk that complements all the information that we had from the morning session and the previous afternoon session. After hearing talks from all the speakers, let's move into the panel discussion session. For this session, we will welcome the panelists from the Indonesian side. Let's welcome Dr. Puji Lestari and Professor Drajat Martianto. Please come to the stage. And please welcome from the Japan side, Professor Eichiro Hukusaki, Professor Tsunehiro Otsuki, and Professor Toshia Muranaka. Please come to the stage. For this panel discussion, the facilitator is Dr. Sastia Pramaputri. To Dr. Sastia, you may come to the stage and lead the discussion. Dr. Sastia, time is yours. Okay, thank you very much to our wonderful MC, Zafi. And uh, I'm going to now start the panel discussion. Uh, welcome to our panelists. First, before we start, I would like to greet uh, Consul General Diana. Welcome to Osaka University. Thank you very much, Ibu, uh, for coming uh, physically here. We are so honored uh, that you will uh, be closing later. Um, so today, we are going to be discussing about several key questions, key urgent questions that we think will give a very good impact and participants from today's uh, talk would probably bring some take home messages from this um, discussion. So in order for us to discuss about what have been said, uh, a lot of data has been presented. I think by now we are assured that uh, this is something that we all have to work hand in hand together in order for us to provide solutions and to overcome challenges um, in order for us to have a better planet with good food security. So in order for us to answer these questions, I would like to first um, ask Professor Drajat Martianto and also maybe in, later uh, it can be added by any of the professors from Osaka University side, regarding the role of universities as educational institution to reduce food loss. Okay, thank you very much. I think uh, there are three ways of uh, every university to be, uh, to be able to contribute to reduce the food loss. Of course, the first one is, uh, as it is just mentioned also by, uh, from the last research yet, yeah? Uh, that um, first is, of course, through education. Particularly nowadays, that we know that uh, the young people, the millennials, usually, um, in my opinion, this is uh, produce may produce uh, food loss and also other ways higher than before. Particularly in Indonesia, for example, because uh, every day they always uh, order food by online. And of course, there is no um, uh, there is no size uh, exact size. Some uh, and also there are so many plastic used, so many styrofoam used. Uh, then, of course, uh, from there, there are so many food waste. And also, uh, based on our small research, it is uh, proven like that. So uh, through education, I think uh, we can change their perspective. Uh, and then we do expect that uh, they can also change their uh, behavior. And again, uh, we do expect also, also that they became the, something like a, <clears throat> uh, what do you call, agents of change for the family and also for the community. And the second is, of course, uh, through uh, our research capacity. Um, we, we need uh, much more research to reduce the food loss, uh, either in uh, post, uh, post surface technology and storage, particularly for Indonesia, the logistic, transportation, Packaging, etc. As I already uh, mentioned beautifully by Professor Fukusaki, there are so many things that we can do, uh, and it's supposed to be a, a collaborative work for the research centers in Indonesia, Japan, and other countries. I think uh, because um, <clears throat> through this research uh, we do, uh, we can uh, 
reduce uh, expectedly, expectedly uh, yeah, if, uh, if we can reduce, if reduce even only 10% or 20%, it is a, a very good uh, effort for us. Uh, and then the third is, of course, through the community services. Uh, in IPB, uh, we, we provide uh, something like incentive for the faculty who want to bring uh, their innova innovation, including this uh, food loss and waste uh, reduction, to their hometown, for example, or other uh, villages, uh, to promote the <clears throat> better uh, uses of food uh, and food waste even. Uh, we, we provide the incentive. And so uh, hopefully we can change uh, the, the <clears throat> ability, uh, can improve the ability of the villagers to be able to maintain the food loss and waste uh, better. Oh. Okay. Wonderful answers. Uh, Professor Drajat, uh, Vice Rector from IPB University, has already uh, given us several of his responses regarding the tri three Dharma Universitas in Indonesia. We call it the three roles of universities and how it relates to reduce food loss. Perhaps anyone uh, from the Japan side would like to add? Anyone? Fukusaki Sensei, would you like to add something to that? This issue? Yes, about the role of uh, university, perhaps if you have anything to add. So, uh, as a university, uh, through the, uh, our project, uh, our next project, so we can provide the very beautiful system uh, in which the uh, cultivates the uh, cutting edge uh, technological uh, human resource. And so I, uh, we, we will make an effort uh, to enhance the ethics level uh, uh, of the human resource who can understand the uh, importance of the ethical consumption. So what is most important uh, is uh, to understand the ethics uh, is more important uh, than uh, to promote the uh, economical uh, spending as an economical activity. But the, every person uh, will prioritize the economical activity. But the, uh, without ethical mind, so to reduce the food loss is uh, very much uh, difficult. That is my idea. Oh, thank you very much uh, for your wonderful addition to what Professor Drajat has mentioned. We agree that uh, everyone probably here needs um, also to understand that ethical and the change of mindset would be crucial to promote this noble mission. So I would like to move on to the next uh, discussion point, which is the measures then. What uh, we already discussed about what we need to do as an educational institution, but what kind of measure can be taken to encourage the active involvement from producers and distributors in reducing food loss? Because here, we have to work hand in hand also with the private sector, and uh, what is probably the idea from uh, the panelists? Perhaps Prof. Rajat or Fukusaki Sensei would like to say something. So the, this issue is very much uh, important and difficult. So before I uh, said the ethics mind is uh, very much important, but the uh, ethics mind would not be enough uh, to promote the, this problem. So to involve the uh, agriculture producer, and the logistics distributor is, what is important is not to reduce the, uh, their benefit, commercial benefit. Uh, and so upstream public engagement is very much important. So in many cases, so cutting edge technology uh, can be established, but the uh, it is very difficult to install the social side uh, without uh, public, uh, upstream public engagement. So to facilitate uh, public engagement, so I make an effort to continue the cross communication between the our side and the Indonesian side, including the local side, producer, and uh, if possible, uh, 
distributor and the retailer and uh, any other stakeholder should be involved, I think. Okay, thank you very much, Kusaki Sensei. I was just informed that actually, due to the div division and preventive measure, we are allowed to remove our mask if you wish. So uh, now I'm removing my mask so we can see each other <laughs> more clearly. Okay, uh, next I would like to ask if, for example, Professor Drajat or Dr. Puji has anything to add to that uh, regarding the encourage, how to encourage producers in the private sectors. Yeah, I'm quite agree with uh, Professor Fukusaki. I just uh, want to add uh, some. Of course, for the uh, uh, producers and also the distributors, the most important thing is that uh, their involvement will increase their benefit, uh, particularly the economic benefit. So based on our discussion um, uh, with them, that uh, usually they need uh, something like incentives from the government. Um, <clears throat> and they need support, uh, like uh, support for the uh, uh, appropriate technology. Because, you know, without uh, any incentive, they still can uh, maintain their business by adding the, uh, the loss part uh, to increase their, uh, their price. So they still get benefit from that. And if uh, then they believe that uh, the changes in uh, their behavior and their uh, uh, production, uh, put in production or distribution will <clears throat> give uh, the benefit, particularly economic benefit, then of course it will be uh, very easy to involve them. And then the second is uh, uh, developing farmer corporation uh, is easier to, uh, for us to organize and also to educate them. Uh, <clears throat> and then uh, we can do uh, much more incentive, intensive campaign, education. That is also uh, work, and that is also uh, uh, very helpful yeah, in, in encouraging them to uh, involve in the uh, <clears throat> reduction of the food loss and waste. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Professor Drajat. Uh, actually, we are requested we can open our mask, uh, so please, uh, so that the audience can see our face. <laughs> okay, so uh, thank you very much for a wonderful addition to the second point of discussion. Um, actually, Professor Fukusaki, in your talk today, uh, you mentioned also about the use of orphan crop. So this is a very interesting concept, uh, and uh, Professor Muranaka here, an expert in plant biotechnology, also in genome editing, uh, is a specialist on that. So. I think uh, the audience probably are very interested to hear more about uh, the use of orphan crop uh, toward food loss reduction. So may I ask what kind of specifications that are needed to develop this orphan crop oriented towards food loss reduction? Please, Moranaka Sensei. Yes, thank you very much. The first of all, many of you not familiar with orphan crop. Do you know the name, orphan crop? Maybe no. So in Japanese, koji sakubotsu, it's also unfamiliar. So you know the major crops such as um, maize, wheat, rice, soybean, or potato. Of course you know. But these major crops uh, from uh, uh, people uh, breed from the wild plants to these uh, major crops. For, in, for example, maize ancestor is a teosinto. It's a very, very small and a very uh, tiny seeds. But the people uh, who are long time breed from the so wild, type, uh, wild, wild type plants to the, the major crops. So on the other hand, in the world, there's many, many plants which are put high potential should be a uh, major crop. One example is uh, millet here in Japanese, uh, still on the way to the major crops. And also that in the Indonesia, many, many uh, medical useful crops, uh, medical useful plants, which are recorded in Jammu, the Indonesian uh, medicinal, uh, medicinal plants. So these kind of plants are still ongoing in the uh, breeding. But it takes time when you use the traditional technology of uh, breeding for more, more than five, uh, more than 10, to not 10 years, but a million years sometimes, um, thousand years. However, if you, we could apply for the genome editing technology, we can reduce that uh, breeding time. 
Then, for example, in the banana, the today is also the major, um, major topics. Banana, and the only one species and one cultivar, Cavendish is a very, very useful use. But there are many uh, wide, uh, many types of the banana species in Indonesia, and one of them are also recorded in the Jammu. So this kind of the, uh, wild banana has a high potential to be a major crops. So I think that uh, it, it might be challenged, but it is a very use, uh, good opportunity to use this genome editing technology apply for this kind of orphan crop to be a, a major crop. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Moranaka Sensei. Excellent information for us who are probably not yet so much familiar with the use of orphan crop. Uh, perhaps, if anything, to add from the Indonesian side, is it is it uh, something that Indonesia probably can look into in the future? The use of orphan crop. Perhaps, do you think there's a possibility to use this orphan crop in the future? Yes. I think. Yeah, I think so. In Indonesia, we have a lot of orphan crops that actually. Until today, the research and even breeding we have not done yet. I mean, just maybe minor research, but with this, I think we, we can support and we can make a, a major or a target that for more depth uh, research for, for this and can be functional for, I mean, benefit for human health, also for maybe food security as well. Thank you. Oh. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Puji. So perhaps a new collaboration uh, can be formed uh, using this uh, as a one of the topic of collaboration under this COI Next project. So um, Professor Otsuki, uh, in your talk today before the panel discussion, mentioned a lot about the behavior of consumers as well, as well as the mindset. Um, it was also has been um, mentioned uh, briefly regarding the foodstuff that is past their expiration dates, usually we have to discard them even though they are still um, good to consume, but probably um, yeah, due to the laws and regulations later on, we will go touch into that. So what do you think, um, like development of technologies oriented towards the effective use of food, foodstuff that is already expired? Thank you. Um, yeah, I don't much uh, knowledge about uh, you know technologies to kind of you know prolong the uh, the freshness uh, of uh, like food uh, to to kind of you know extend the uh, expiration. I mean, the, the, you know, extend the the product life uh, to not to pass the expiration date. Oh, um, but <clears throat> I, I think that Japan has a like one third uh, rule. Uh, that they divide the expiration date into three periods, and then the, they set the uh, actual, I mean, the, the, you know, um, like, um, the expiration date written in label uh, is just one, uh, I mean, two thirds of the you know, expiration um, date. So um, people uh, can still you know, eat those food, but uh, they, um, <coughs> they're uh, discarded. Um, so that's uh, that can be uh, corrected, um, and then uh, one must be careful about the uh, you know uh, the characteristics of a different uh, uh, food. Like there are like perishables and uh, non-perishables, like you know the more durable uh, kind of uh, uh, food. So the uh, durable foods are okay. Uh, that can be you know the extended. Um, Without any risk, but the perishables are, are risky. So, the, if I can think of the technologies, um, then uh, it will be helpful uh, to to um, provide the technologies to detect the say, uh, um, the condition of uh, food uh, in terms of freshness or uh, you know in terms of uh, the density of uh, microbials. So that uh, it correctly, precisely evaluate the risk of consumption uh, of the food um, that expired, uh, I mean, that, that, ex that, that, that uh, exceeded the, uh, the expiration date. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Otsuki-sensei, for your uh, answers. I think this is uh, 
quite interesting yeah, that the, the government actually categorize uh, different products and then this would probably be uh, better um, implemented in other countries that have not implemented that yet so that we could um, categorize how we can use this uh, food stuff that go beyond the expiration date. Uh, this is quite interesting and I, I also just uh, found out about this knowledge, new knowledge. Uh, so you mentioned that also regarding the technologies itself to uh, use the food stuff past their expiration dates. Uh, can any one of the panelists can uh, touch upon the technological aspect of how we could um, for, for example, uh, use this kind of food stuff? Um, perhaps if there's anything to add from the panelists? Okay, I think uh, the answer was uh, quite clear uh, that um, once they go beyond the expiration date, probably the regulations that um, we have to consider before that uh, is very crucial. Then later on the sorting, and then uh, we could work together um, on this kind of uh, aspect. So I think this is something that we could think about um, how we could develop together the technology. Maybe it's not yet well developed, but through this uh, COI Next project and in collaboration between Japan and Indonesia, probably this is also something that we can work on in the near future. So finally, um, the last question is um, because we have already mentioned um, that this project probably will not be as successful if we don't work in hand, hand in hand in collaboration with multiple multidisciplinary uh, scientists from different fields as well as the people from the government. Here we have a very strong support from the representative of uh, Indonesian government um, in Japan as well as uh, from Brin also from the government uh, who are here with us today. Um, so we would like to later uh, discuss about the consideration regarding the Indonesian laws and regulation when conducting research and developing technologies related to food loss. Perhaps, uh, Dr. Puji, if you would like to add um, your perspective regarding the Indonesian laws and regulations, please. Thank you. Shall I answer according to research and innovation? And first is a brain, but we will uh, brought with the collaboration. Actually, this food loss is not the responsibility, not only one institution, but also government, private sector, or actors from producer and consumers, not only in national level, but also global level. So in Indonesia, actually, based on the presidential decree number 78, 2021, BRIN was established uh, and has functioned as an authority to do research, invention, and innovation. So all of the research institutions under ministries and other research organizations are integrated into BRIN since 2022. And uh, for this, uh, actually, all also the scientists uh, work in BRIN, so it is very easy that there is one entry point to Indonesia based on the governmental research institution which are well engaged with universities, also industries, also in uh, international level. And especially in Brin, we have 12 research organizations with specific mandate, including a research organization for agriculture and food, and this is responsible for food loss. It's the main uh, focus. And recently, just recently, President gave instruction to Brin that Brain should focus on food and energy. Yes, with the consideration first, we are afraid of the uh, food crisis, especially like the Ukraine war. It's impact a lot for the food supply chain. So for this, actually, uh, in line with the national, what's that? National Food Agency, they have goal also about food loss not only on quality, but quantity is already uh, meet with a brain. So we have a brief synergize with the National Food Agency, and we will work together about the food loss. So in addition uh, to that, also ministries, Ministry of Agriculture have mapping about the food loss, especially like this one. 
each district in Indonesia, it was a lot of island in Indonesia, and some of them have food insecurity. And one of the main factors is a lot of food waste. And also less yield from the plant varieties that are not well adapted in the local environment. So Brin is responsible to uh, generate any superior plant varieties, also including uh, livestock that have high yield and high adaptable to any building abiotic stress, the high tolerance. So they have the high yields, I mean, with high um, step. I mean, the yield loss can be, uh, I mean, decrease. So for this, Breen recently, uh, we have also collaboration with uh, Osaka, yeah, here. So we start to have this collaboration. So not only with international, but in international level, Breen have the like platform how to do research in the in the food loss is based on the market driven research and innovation to get target. I mean to make precision of the outputs can be used for the users and also support ministries because the policies in the ministries so all of the food loss technology should be used to be a support the policy or the technical implementing unit in the ministry so it can be used widely in national level. So for this collaboration, again, not only in, the, in Indonesia, but also uh, inter international level. Since this responsibility, not only uh, the organization like Breen, so there is a, wait, uh, I had just searched. Uh, sorry. There is a presidential decree number 97, 2017, National Policy and Strategy on Household Waste Management. And the second one, presidential decree number 35, 2018, about acceleration of waste management installation to be electrical energy based on environmental friendly technology. So it's the food and energy is the focus the uh, Indonesian research. So it's hopefully, it's, we need, it can meet the, the, the uh, is that the demand of uh, any consumers and also help export any in the national level for food security as well. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, a lot of knowledge, uh, very good uh, information uh, presented by our panelists today. And I'm sure uh, the audience here also uh, can take the benefit from the expertise and the views and uh, pr new perspectives that are shared by our distinguished panelists. So with that, I would like to close today's uh, panel discussion. And I would like to thank and uh, give a big round of applause to our distinguished panelists. Thank you very much. Okay, with the end of this uh, panel uh, discussion session, I would like to uh, return uh, the chairmanship uh, back to the MC, and uh, thank you very much to our panels. Thank you very much for, to all the speakers, Dr. Sastia Pramaputri, and all participants for the discussion that we had today. I would like to thank also to all distinguished guests, speakers, and also the moderator for the fruitful discussion that we had from the morning until now. Now, we have already arrived at the end of the symposium. To close this event, first, I would like to invite Ms. Diana Emila Sari Sutikno as the Consul General of the Republic of Indonesia in Osaka to give her closing remarks on this event. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Ms. Diana. His Excellency, Mr. Heri Ahmadi, the Ambassador of the Republic of Indonesia for Japan and Micronesia, Professor so Shojiro Nishio, the President of Osaka University, Professor Genta Kawahara, the Vice President of Osaka University, Dr. Kazuzi Kuse, GST, Next Program Officer, 
Dr. Laksana Trihandoko, the Chairman of the Indonesia, na, Indonesia's National Research and Innovation Agency, or BRIN. Professor Arif Satria, President of the IPB. Professor Reni Wirahadi Kusuma, the President of Bandung Institute of Technology. Professor Dr. Drajat Marianto, Vice Rector of IPB. Dr. Puji Rastari, also from BRIN. Professor Yusli Wadianto, the Education and Cultural Attaché, Indonesian Embassy in Tokyo. Distinguished speakers, panelists, guests of today's symposium, participants, ladies and gentlemen. Konnichiwa. It is my great pleasure to deliver the closing remarks at this important Food Loss and Waste Reduction Hub International Symposium. The symposium is a form of continued efforts or collaboration between the Indonesian government, particularly today represented here by BRIN, as well as from higher education institutions, which are also present, and also between them and Osaka University. This effort is part of Osaka University collaboration with Indonesia in the following three fields, health, food, and biotech, these three cooperations or areas of cooperations are stipulated in the letter of intent name, uh, to strengthen cooperation in the field of health, food, and biotech, which was signed by His Excellency Ambassador, Indonesian Ambassador to Japan, uh, Doc, uh, Mr. Harry Ahmadi, and Professor Nishio Shujiro, the president of Osaka University on June last year. Distinguished speakers and participants, food loss, is indeed a serious global issue. Solution is required as part of the attainment of SDGs. As we know that SDGs 12.3 pertains to responsible consumption and production, which are aimed to halve food waste and reduce food loss by 2030. So we don't really have much time. Reducing food losses and waste is essential in a world where the number of people affected by hunger has been slowly on the rise since 2014. And tons and tons of edible food are lost and wasted, or and or wasted every day. Globally, around 14% of food produced is lost between harvest and retail, while an estimated 17% of total global food production is wasted, 11% in households, 5% in the food service, and 2% in retail. So I think all of us are responsible for this grim picture, yet at the same time we have opportunity to overcome that by working together. Unfortunately, Indonesia has the second largest amount of food waste per capita in the world, due, of course, one of the factors to its large population. So several studies have found more than 60% of solid food waste in, to, in two Indonesian cities, Surabaya and in East Java and Bogor in West Java, is from food. In Indonesia, the total amount of food wasted during the storage, processing, and distribution stages is 44% or 48 million tons per year, which accounts for 3.7% of the world's 1.3 billion tons of food loss. Colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, this is not really a great picture, of course, for all of us, and in particular for Indonesia, this is such a grim picture despite the fact that Indonesians are generally taught not to waste food. There is also a popular tradition Indonesian saying, don't waste rice or else the rice will cry. I hope many of the Indonesian here still remember this uh, traditional saying. To solve the food disposal problems in Indonesia, all experts from industries, governments, and ac academia have gathered or you know, have collected efforts, uh, you know, concerted efforts to consider ways to create a society where all people are happy and an environmentally friendly society under one roof of food loss and waste reduction innovation hub. The team used their knowledge and skills not only to solve issues in Indonesia, but also global issues related to SDGs 12.3. 
I do appreciate that everyone joining today's symposium has stressed the importance of a triple helix cooperation between governments, industries, and academia to overcome and handle these very important global issues related to food security. In this context, the bilateral collaboration between Indonesia and Japan in this field is not only deemed vital, but also strategic, given the fact that Japan, as the fellow G20 member countries, Indonesia right now is the president of G20 for 2022, and Japan in particular, as the G20 member country, has performed particularly well in the food loss and waste management. Therefore, Indonesia indeed must learn from Japan how to improve and better and better handle the food waste, whether in household, food service, and retail, among others. So I uh, took this data from the Food Waste 2021 um, study uh, of the G20 countries. Distinguished speakers, ladies and gentlemen, I would also like to take this opportunity to convey my profound appreciation and gratitude to Professor Fukusaki and team and in particular, I would like to mention uh, the important role played by Dr. Satria Pramaputri, Associate Professor, Graduate School of Engineering, which together with her team assembled the project of Osaka University Food Loss and Waste Reduction Innovation Hub, True Food DX. The later means digital transformation of food, which will help, which will help us understand how food products are made of, distributed, and sold based on cutting-edge technologies such as metabolomics, metabolomics profiling and freeze-drying technology, as well as advanced semiconductors technologies. Of course, I'm not the expert of this type of, you know, very you know, sophisticated term, but when I was working at the Indonesian Food and Drug Authority or FDA or Indonesian Badan Pengawas Obat and Makanan as the uh, head of the international cooperation, I was introduced and also learned so much about the importance of ensuring the safety and quality of food, especially because uh, the Indonesian FDA is responsible for food, uh, processed food products. So. Not only that, the regulatory authority needs also to be included in the conversation about how to ensure and how to manage the food loss and food waste. And I think all of us indeed have the responsibility to continue ensuring that our uh, world, uh, especially uh, given 2030 uh, SDGs agenda, would be more secure in terms of the food uh, security or food safety. So by focusing on social implementation of new technology related to food and research, the teams working on social problems related to food, we will create a society where food loss be reduced and ethical consumption, consumption be realized. The symposium today has provided an important avenue for such discussion to take place, involving multiple stakeholders from various fields of expertise. I would like to also warmly congratulate the organizing committee and all parties involved in the symposium for the great initiative and unique discussion platform provided. Through working together, we can indeed move faster toward achieving this common goal. In conclusion, the Indonesian Consul General in Osaka, together of course with the Indonesian Embassy in Tokyo as the government representatives in Japan, will always stand ready to support all forms of cooperation between Indonesia and Japan, including in particular on this important field aimed to assist the achievement of the SDGs, especially in this case SDGs 12.3, as well as enhance the overall bilateral relations between Indonesia and Japan. So thank you very much for your attention. Arigato gozaimasu. Thank you very much, Ms. Diana, for the inspiring speech and closing remarks. Next, we would like to invite the director and vice president of Osaka University to deliver his closing speech. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Professor Genta Kawahara. Good afternoon and greetings to His Excellency, Mr. Heri Ahumadi, Ambassador Extra Extraordinary and Plenipotentiary of the Republic of Indonesia in Japan, Ms. Diana Stikuno, the Consul General of the Republic of Indonesia in Osaka, Dr. Rakusana Tori Handoko, Chairman 
of Burin National Research and Innovation Agency, the Republic of Indonesia. Dr. Kazushi Kuse, Program Officer of the Program on Open Innovation, Platform of, for Industry Academia, co-creation, known as COI Next of JSD, the Japan Society Science and Technology Agency. Distinguished speakers and participants from Indonesia, Japan, and all over the world, and my colleagues from Osaka University. It is my great pleasure to deliver closing remarks at the end of this COI Next Symposium at Osaka University. I would like to express my most sincere gratitude to all of you for your participation in this joint event between the Republic of Indonesia and Osaka University. The Republic of Indonesia and Osaka University have been promoting significant academic collaboration in research and education. In June 2021, His Excellency, Mr. Heri Akumadi, visited Dr. Shoujiro Nishio, President of Osaka University, and both sides agreed to strengthen the existing joint activities and establish future cooperation, especially in the fields of health, food, and biotechnology. Afterward, Ms. Diana Stukuno, the Consul General of the Republic of Indonesia in Osaka, delivered a public lecture on gender equality and women's empowerment at Osaka University in January this year, followed by a webinar on the cooperation between Indonesia and Japan in the health sector by Mr. Toripuru Naja, Vice Ambassador of the Republic of Indonesia in Japan, and Ms. Stikuno in February. In the light of Ambassador Harris and President Nishio's agreement, Osaka University is now enhancing existing institutional collaboration in the joint campus with Institute Technology Bandon and launching research project on food loss and waste reduction with Institute Technology, excuse me, Institute Perutanian Bogo. Osaka University is also planning to have the memorandum of understanding with Burin National Research and Innovation Agency, the Republic of Indonesia, to promote research and innovation cooperation. In our collaboration with Burin, we will promote activities to strengthen academic research in a wide variety of fields, including the advanced technology of agriculture and food. And we would also be very happy to receive young researchers from Burin who would get their PhD at Osaka University. To end my speech, I would like to thank everyone for their tireless efforts in making this symposium a reality. We shall extend my much closer academic collaboration in research and education together with our Indonesian partners. We would be very much appreciate your strong support. Thank you very much for your attention. With that speech from Ms. Diana and Professor Genta Kawahara, the symposium event is officially closed. I would like to thank all the distinguished guests, speakers, and participants that joined from the beginning until the end of the event, whether it is virtually and also together with us in this venue. I personally think that we have had a productive and inspiring time together. And finally, I hope everyone that joined the symposium found the presentations informative and helpful and enable us to resolve the food loss problem together using Japanese technology and beginning with Indonesia to the entire world. Before we part, I have two announcements to all participants. First is about the event survey. 
To participants that joined this event on site, please kindly fill out the survey or enquete that has been given to you at the beginning of the event. Later, the committee will collect the survey at the front door. For participants that joined this event online, please kindly fill out the survey when you close the Zoom meeting. The second announcement is about business card exchange meeting. To all participants that joined this event on site, we will have business card exchange meeting at training room downstairs on the first floor. This event is open to all participants until 5 p.m. After this, to all distinguished guests and speakers, as well as moderators, there will be a photo session, so please remain in the venue. And lastly, please accept this verse, or traditionally in Indonesia, it's called Pantun. So to all of my Indonesian friends, please respond accordingly. I'm gonna start. Kalau ada sumur di ladang. Thank you. Boleh kami menumpang mandi. Kalau ada umur yang panjang, boleh kita berjumpa lagi. See you next time on the next symposium. Thank you very much and otskare sama desta. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. To all speakers, as well as guests and moderators, please go to the stage for a photo session. Thank you.